I'm an investigative reporter. Um, I usually deal in truth. But today, I'm going to start with a fairy tale. Once upon a time in Australia, a man came along who claimed to have invented a magic pill. You put this pill in your motor vehicle, and it made your fuel last 20% longer. Not only that, it eliminated all of the toxic emissions. Now, you might think this is a perfectly silly story, but the magic pill company raised about $100 million from investors who all thought they were going to be wealthy. The Australian Trade Commission devoted an entire part of its website to this company. And the leaders of this company were paraded at official um, trade functions and missions overseas as an example to other companies on how to do business. This company got $400,000 in taxpayer grants for sales it had never made. For what you have to understand at this point is that this was no ordinary company. It had no factories. It had no trucks to move its goods. In fact, it had no goods at all. But it had penetrated deeply into Australia's elite. Many of them secretly held shares in the company, and they too thought they were going to be wealthy. So when I exposed all this as a fraud, I faced lawsuits. There were attacks in the Australian Senate. And I went through what every investigative reporter goes through, the, all that fear and doubt that you have when powerful people don't want something made public. This firm was registered in a tax haven called the British Virgin Islands. And what it had been doing was selling shares in itself and then sending that money to the British Virgin Islands and to other tax havens and then bringing the money back to Australia as if it were sales of the magic pill. As long as new investors could be found and as long as the share price continued to rise, the game continued. It continued for nearly 18 months, even after I exposed it as a fraud, until finally the company stopped paying the lawyers who were suing me. <laughs> after I wrote the book about the magic pill, a mysterious package arrived in the mail. It was a computer hard drive, the, the kind you can buy in any store. But this one was packed with documents. It was the biggest cache of inside information into the tax haven system ever obtained by a journalist. There were 2.5 million secret records. If you were to measure it in gigabytes, it was about 160 times larger than the State Department records obtained by WikiLeaks. There are 120,000 clients from more than 170 countries. I remember Googling one name. It was a man from Canada who was missing. He had allegedly been killed by the mob, but here he was inside my database with an email address like on the run at hotmail.com. <laughs> and I remember thinking to myself at the time, wouldn't it be great if I knew a journalist in Canada that I could give this to? That presented a dilemma for me. I've spent most of my career as an investigative reporter. By nature, investigative reporters are lone wolves. We fiercely guard our secrets, sometimes even from our editors, because we know that the minute we tell them what we're working on, they want the story the next day. <laughs> and to be perfectly frank, when you get a good story like this, you like to keep the glory to yourself. <laughs> It's funny, though, how life sort of brings you in certain directions. A few months after I got the computer hard drive, I got an email from my old professor at the University of Michigan. He was on a board that ran an organization called the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. And this is a body that brings investigative reporters around the world together to work on cross-border projects. It's based here in DC, and it's part of a larger organization called the Center for Public Integrity. He said they were looking for a new head of the network, and how did I fancy coming to Washington for a few years? Well, this presented me with another dilemma. Should I take a pay cut and ask my wife to leave her job and our home and move overseas to work for a nonprofit? <laughs> and besides, you know, what do I have anyway? This is what the raw data looked like. This represents about 30 years 
of records of people who set up offshore companies for clients. But if you go far deep into one of these files, what you'll find are random PDFs, spreadsheets with thousands of names of clients, Word documents, and even the occasional personal photograph, like this one. <laughs> I began to do what every journalist after me would do. I began to look for big names. And sure, I recognized some of the figures in there. There were wealthy Australians, people I recognized. But perhaps the best story was the behind the scenes of the Magic Pill Company, and I'd already written about that. I learned an important lesson at this early stage. This story was not just about big names. What I had here was an unprecedented view into a secret world, the world of tax havens. And this is where secrecy in itself is its currency. And this anonymity, well, it allows individuals and corporations to set up complex structures to avoid tax. It allows frauds, like the Magic Pill Company. Sometimes it can even pit entire nations and economies against one another. You just have to look at the fiscal crisis in Greece or the banking meltdown in Cyprus. Neither the Bernie Madoff or the Enron scandals would have happened if it had not been for tax havens. And consider this. It's now estimated that half of all world trade and one-third of all world wealth goes through tax havens. So you're probably thinking, well, this is all really interesting, but why should I care? <laughs> Think about it. If these people and these corporations are not paying their tax, you're paying more. Now, do you remember that consortium I talked about? Well, about 100 of those reporters went to work in more than 50 countries. Over a period of about one and a half years, we built the biggest collaboration in journalism history. And slowly but surely, the stories began to emerge from this vast sort of spider web of information we had. And on the 4th of April this year, we managed to publish in major media simultaneously in 35 countries. The Freude daran, that through this public scandal, the world is only about to be evacuated partout au monde. Une enquête. Well, it's a story that's made headlines around the world. A massive leak of information on offshore tax havens, revealing millions of secret documents. These are some of the stories we, we published. You might not recognize this woman, but you might remember her mother, Emelda Marcos, the shoe lady. This is the deputy speaker of the Mongolian parliament. We found him with a secret Swiss bank account that had a million dollars in it. He had to resign. This is a campaign treasurer for the French president. This little story nearly brought down the French government. This is the first family from Azerbaijan. They probably don't care what we reveal. <laughs> <laughs> and these are the Swiss bankers that were the middlemen in some of these deals. And we found lots of billionaires from Indonesia. This is a masterpiece by Van Gogh. It was traded using a tax haven. And this man here, well, he's probably the most famous banker in Europe. He too had to resign. And this is the son of the former Korean president. His home was raided and his valuables were taken away. Now, these stories changed laws and more laws and more changes have been promised. Hundreds of people around the world have begun receiving letters from their tax authorities. And we know that they've already recovered tens of millions of dollars. The five richest nations in Europe got together and they've now decided to share tax information. And we've been credited with putting the whole issue of tax havens on the agenda of both the, the G8 and the G20. But why else is this a big deal? Well, journalism's in crisis. The business models that sustained investigative reporting are broken. You know, any one of these reporters could have gone with the story before the others, but they didn't. I guess the fairy tale ending here is that this worked. But of course, now that we've all experienced the big story, none of us want to go back to our little small stories again. So, if there's anyone else out there <laughs> with a computer hard drive, this is where you can find me. Thank you.